Thank you. We're now live. Happy, happy, peaceful transfer of power. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Um, so we have with us uh, Gus Selig and Jen Holler. Jen, is it true that John retired? He did. He retired from Downs Rackland Martin and government affairs work. He's thinking about his next step. So far, wow. he's, been, he's been making awesome dinners every night. So it's working out great for me. Wow. wow. Does he deliver? <laughs> Check on Windsor. <laughs> um, okay, well, you guys are obviously far from newbies to this process. Um, I'm going to turn it over to both of you, however you want to do it. Essentially, what we want to get is an update from last September of what you've been doing and what you see in the future that needs to be done, either continuation of your programs or new ideas. And I'm sure you could talk for hours on it, but you've got about 45 minutes. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a presentation in the offing here. <laughs> uh Mr. Chairman, uh, for the record, Gus Selig, Executive Director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And with me is our Policy Director, Jen Holler, will share the presentation. Um, I am not great at screen sharing, so I'm going to try to get the presentation up. We will cover the coronavirus relief funding, um, um, uh, as well as other activities, including uh, we usually do not spend any time in your committee, but we have some important economic development work we do in rural economic development work. So we've got a few slides on that. Um, I want to say um, to Senator Rahm, this is the first time I think I've had the opportunity to testify in a committee that you've been sitting in. So welcome and look forward to working with you. And with that, let me see if I can get the screen share up. If I can't, Jen will. Well, you're doing that, Gus. I, I started in general housing and military affairs on the house side, and so we did cross paths then. Cross paths. You cross and you cross you cross paths in ways and means. Ways too. and means, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Keisha and I served together on ways and means for what four years? Yeah. 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 Okay, so here here we go, and uh, let's see. Uh, Gus, does this have you sent this to Nathan? Is it up on our website? I believe it is. I think Jen sent it to him this morning. So, Thanks, Jen. Um, so just as broad overview, this is um, what our statute statute tells us to do in 10 VSA Chapter 15. And I just want to make note that it is about um, not just housing and conservation, but economic vitality and quality of life for Vermonters. Um, the map here that you see is actually... We, we, we don't see anything, Gus. Ah, well, then I'm going to uh, stop trying to screen share because that's not working and ask Jen to do that. So are you seeing uh, anything yeah. on the Green now. It says okay. COVID response and recovery. Okay, great. So let's go to the next slide, Jen. And here's our mission statement uh, for all of you that comes from the statute that you gave us. The map that you're looking at is the village of Shelburne. And this is what we call a dual goal project, which is the highest priority in our statute. And it includes a large amount of conserved land, a along the La Plot, which is one of those waterways that we've actually been able to measure improvements in water quality. And the construction of uh, two different projects, I think um, something like 100 different units, one by Cathedral Square Corporation and one by CHT in the village, along with four homes that were built by Habitat for Humanity, um, that um, the community welcomed and supported. We weren't sure that that would always happen. Let's go on to the next slide, Jen. And this is our work writ large over 33 years. Um, and, um, and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, as I said later in the presentation, about the, ADA, about the businesses that are enrolled in our Farm and Forest Viability Program and a program 
Senator Starr initiated called the Rural Economic Development Initiative. That farm and forest viability program, in addition to its normal business, assisted 524 businesses this year with COVID relief funding all over the state. Um, I guess I just want to say before I turn it over to Jen uh, to talk about the Coronavirus Relief Fund, uh, that this has been a really challenging year for everybody. Um, uh, and uh, I think a very emotional last week for all of us. Um, and uh, yesterday or Monday, I was talking with um, our AmeriCorps volunteers um, about Dr. King and Dr. King's legacy. I had the great fortune as an eight-year-old to actually be at the March on Washington in 1963. Um, and uh, I can't tell you I remember Dr. King's speech from that day. I think I mostly remember lots of singing and Mahalia Jackson and long walks and a hot day. Um, but I was recently reading um, the Meacham biography uh, on John Lewis, and there's a point in it where Arthur Schlesinger Jr., uh, one of the president's key advisors, was um, talking about the need for the vote for civil rights and voting rights legislation and saying in the 21st century, people will look back and think, weren't we crazy, essentially, to have the society that we had? And here we are 57 years later, dealing with such fundamental issues uh, among all of us. And, and as we think about our mission, we think from the moment we were invented, it was about providing access supporting inclusion, and we are absolutely committed to continuing that work as best we can. There's a number of other public policy goals that we can achieve through our work, and that's included water quality, it's included smart growth, it's included climate, it includes dealing with the opioid epidemic and supporting um, recovery residences and, and the creation of them. Um, it's about community gathering spaces. Um, it's also about providing in a time where we need to be socially distant places for people to recreate safely outdoors. And it's very much about providing access to housing of all types from rental housing to home ownership. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jen to talk about um, what we did with the CRF funding that we thank you for your enormous support uh, in providing funding to us to get out to your constituents to help people in great need in this crisis. So Jen, the floor is yours. Okay, so um, uh, an enormous thank you for entrusting us with a large amount of the coronavirus relief funds. Um, over the course of a few bills, you allocated 34.25 million to VHCB and um, you did um, dedicated CRF for housing for a number of other entities and we've coordinated with them. You'll hear from others um, later this morning, but our piece in that effort was to provide permanent housing and safe shelter for the folks who are experiencing homelessness related to the, to the pandemic. Um, and at the time we had estimated with the funding you're gonna provide, we'd be able to do about 250, secure 250 new permanent homes um, we've able, been able to achieve very close to that and, and also made other improvements as well. What you see on the left here in the pictures, and we've gotten all around the state. At the top is an apartment building in St. Johnsbury where five new apartments were brought back online and are now um, uh, dedicated through the local coordinated entry system to uh, folks who are experiencing homelessness in the middle is the Upper Valley Haven. They've made improvements there that allow the shelters, which are often very crowded, to make improvements to improve, um, allow greater distancing and safety um, and um, comply with CDC guidance. At the bottom is um, a housing development in Middlebury, where now four apartments will be specifically set aside and targeted to those who are experiencing homelessness and they'll be supported with services. So here's a, um, here's a look at the results of that money. Um, and I wanna say also thank you for the confidence in VHCB. And, um, you acted very early on in your first bill, S350, with some business recovery grants and then the initial allocation to us in order to get started. It typically takes two or three years to develop a housing project. 
um, and we had just six months. Um, so with that early signal, we were able to work and sort of activate the nonprofit housing network to go out and look for opportunities around the state um, for where housing could be secured in areas where there were a great number of people in temporarily placed in motels and we coordinated with the Agency of Human Services around that. Um, and here are the results. You can see where we've gotten around the state. Each of the communities is listed. Um, there are 247 new homes um, in 15 different locations that were acquired and or rehabbed and are now permanently affordable housing. We also made grants to 12 different emergency shelters around the state that have made the kinds of improvements I described just a second ago. Um, here, I'm gonna run through a few examples um, just to give you an idea of the variety. Um, uh, it took a, a good amount of creativity and there is um, um, quite a range of types of different housing that were, that were made permanent um, and available to folks who are homeless um, as a result of this funding. So here's a big one. Um, this is in um, um, Essex Junction, the former Baymont Inn and Suites was purchased by the Champlain Housing Trust, has been renovated and is now 68 um, permanent apartments for people moving out of homelessness. Um, this is um, a really unusual one. This is a former John Deere dealership in Rutland, which has now been um, completely um, rehabbed and is nine apartments with supportive services in a collaboration with a local homelessness agency, the health, the mental health agency and the medical center down there. Um, it's a highly energy efficient building. There will be services provided and um, We've just learned that the cherry on the top is going to be um, a solar array that's going to be paid for um, by v -Light, the Vermont Low Income, um, uh, with some old um, energy money. You might recall that uh, there was a proposal in Burlington because the low barrier shelter had to close down because it couldn't be um, safe in a COVID time um, for some shipping containers to create a new um, near Sears Lane. Uh, and there was a variety of opinions about that. Our board actually declined to fund that proposal when it came to us. We kept working with a new, which was the proponent of the proposal, and they eventually were able to purchase and renovate and get done by December 30th, um, um, changes to the Champlain Inn, which um, will now be 33 units and can house up to 50 people um, along with um, services. And there's also um, uh, office and community space there. We've helped among the shelters that we've provided or is one in, um, that we've assisted is one in Rutland and then in Wyndham and Windsor County. Um, uh, those shelters are, are now made safer. This is a pre COVID picture of people going through a training to help support the folks in those places. Um, another one of the larger projects is in Colchester, the former Handy Suites, the Champlain Housing Trust worked with steps to end domestic violence to secure this building, renovate it and um, it's now um, 21, um, it now can be home up to 21 households and there were 18 adults and 19 children were sheltering there over the holidays and there more have been moved in since. This is one of um, the more unusual properties. It's a former um, um, chalet uh, a motel, very famous in the um, Brattleboro area. It's been purchased and renovated. Um, there's also additional land on the site so future housing development may um, may be possible there. There's a very close collaboration here between the Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust and Groundworks Collaborative, the local homeless and shelter provider. I want to note here that um, there was another motel that was um, um, that could have been purchased, but it was much larger. It was 60 or 70 units and there was a discussion um, in the community and at the state level around whether that made sense or not. And um, um, there were a variety of opinions and some thought well let's go for the let's go for the building that's got the most potential new homes but in consultation with the agency of human services and um, thinking about what's going to make the best permanent housing it was decided that that level of concentration of people with high needs maybe wasn't the best answer and that also it was going to be difficult to have the services to support all of them and in the end this was this was decided to be the better um, the better long term investment. Jenna, um, I have a question. Um, okay. Don't mean to interrupt your presentation. Oh, please do. Um, it's just a preview of what we can expect to hear from homeless advocates and stuff. But I'd like to hear it from either you or Gus. Uh, 
we were sort of delirious in our joy last year when we were talking about building back better together. And at some point there was even some talk that we can permanently end homelessness with this program. What's the status of that goal right now as you see it in the housing world and community? I think we've since learned that there's been changes in a lot of the metrics and we're nowhere near that goal at this point. I think that's right. There's been a lot of good that has happened and a lot of people now have permanent homes that don't. And I don't wanna lose sight of that. If our assumptions or what we knew back in um, June still held, we would be on our way to ending homelessness. The funding that you provided was gonna make available through a variety of ways, um, enough housing or rental assistance that could have helped folks that were in motels at that time to secure permanent housing, either through the rental rehab program Josh will tell you about, through this program or rental assistance that was gonna help people move into existing housing. And hundreds of people have done that, but the pandemic's gone on longer. The economic fallout um, is been more severe. And there, while people have been coming out of motels, unfortunately more have fallen into homelessness and, and um, the numbers are now higher than they were when we first began talking about this. So the challenge remains, but that doesn't mean that this in no way, um, in no way does that mean that we didn't achieve um, what we had hoped to achieve in terms of the number of units and the people who are permanently housed. I just add one other point. There's something like, like 1800 households, probably over 2000 Vermonters in motels as we speak. Um, and there are a number of them that have rental assistance vouchers that have been issued, but there aren't enough, there isn't enough housing. And so we continue, and we said this last spring, to say a big part of the problem is a supply problem. Um, and in Vermont, and we're not the only place experiencing this, without increasing supply, we cannot solve this problem. So our long-term work of adding homes across the state need needs to continue. It's a, it's a continuing need. We have a shortage. It's clearly, we had a lot of Vermonters who were doubled up prior to the uh, pandemic. Uh, they were never counted under the official HUD count as being homeless. And uh, those are households that found it probably was not safe to be doubled up. Uh, so that's added to this. But we clearly have a supply problem that that we will need to continue to address in order to get at get at this issue. And we're doing it at a time, and we'll get to this at the end of the presentation, where real estate prices are going up in many markets, which is gonna close off access to some folks. Okay, I, I, I apologize for that diversion, but I want us to, to center the committee and where we're ultimately gonna go with a lot of this. And I, we're gonna hear a lot more from uh, other people on homelessness services and supply. So I just wanted to get that out on the table. So I'm sorry, Jen, why don't you continue? Okay, and please do interrupt at any time. It's one of the disadvantages of, of the screen sharing is that it's harder to, to see where, where people may have questions. So I'm gonna keep running through a couple different examples of the new homes that were created. Um, so some zero um, energy modular homes um, have been uh, purchased and placed on empty lots and mobile home parks. So here's one in Bristol, five more will go. Um, and there are, um, um, there are three that are gonna be installed there and five more are gonna be delivered um, to parks in Bradford and Hardwick. And again, those um, homes will be made available to homeless families that are referred through the local coordinated, um, the local continuums of care and coordinated entry system. How much do they cost, uh, total cost of siting one of these new homes? All in, they're about $175,000, including the frost wall foundations that HUD requires and the solar package to help make them a zero energy home. And how many of these did we do statewide? Eight, uh, eight of these. How many? Eight, eight of these. Eight, okay. Yep. Another example of 
we've done is that um, tiny homes in Barrie. So one of these had been done, one of these homes had been done previously and they were being constructed by students at Norwich. Um, but Norwich had to shut down so they couldn't complete the second unit. So we were able to use CR, this was a place we were able to use CRF funds to fill that hole. There was no longer that essentially free labor, um, but the money um, filled in. So these are homes for chronically mental um, uh, people with um, chronically mental, uh, chronic homelessness and supported by Washington County Mental Health, excuse me, I stumbled over that. Um, this one's a little unusual, it's in Chittenden County. The Ho-Hum Motel was purchased by the Champlain Housing Trust in coordination with uh, the Agency of Human Services. There was really a need for a facility where folks who are homeless um, to, that could isolate or recover from COVID. Um, obviously, you can't stay safe in your home if you don't have a home. So being homeless during a pandemic is really, really a, a vulnerable and um, awful place to be. So um, the Ho-Hum has been um, housing people who are either been, as I said, exposed or have come down with COVID. And Vermont's done really, really well um, in keeping its homeless population safe, which of course, um, is important on a humanitarian level, but also um, reduces costs to the state in terms of their of their of their care. And this and this property can can be eventually be turned to permanent housing um, when um, the pandemic's over. So, so now I'm going to turn. Oh, go ahead, Senator. So I have a question. Um, you know, we're all faced with this challenge of getting money out the door quickly and the December 30th deadline and things like that. Do you have any feel whatsoever whether the people that were selling you these properties uh, knew that and took advantage of it and got top dollar as opposed to market value for these purchases? And if so, I hope there would be some idea going forward how to make sure that does not happen. Um, it was definitely a tough negotiating environment, uh, Senator. There were there was hopes to do projects in central Vermont and in the Upper Valley that um, did not take place because an agreement on price could not be met, whether that was driven by what the owners knew uh, in terms of the availability of funds or, you know, when you're selling a property, you know, there, if you have a number of members of a family involved in it, which was true in one case, they maybe, maybe some wanted to get out of the bid their business and others did not. Um, uh, but it was definitely a tougher, when you have to do things really quickly, um, you are at a disadvantage. We know um, that as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn it over to Gus to talk about our, uh, more of our core work. And as you mentioned, um, Senator Sirach and the, the ongoing work that's going to need to continue to happen and what we see coming. Um, so I'm going to just take a very few minutes and then we'll get back to your questions uh, just to run through the kind of work we have always been doing, uh, some of which we've done with the housing revenue bond. Uh, the building on the left uh, really was the conception of the leadership of the city of St. Albans. It's right across from City Hall. Uh, it was part of a redevelopment of what they considered one of the most blighted buildings in the community. Uh, also includes, not funded by us, uh, new office space uh, for community college and for their medical center. But this is 30 apartments done by the Champlain Housing Trust with um, five or six of them reserved for homeless families. Private builder has all, also got some revenue bond help uh, for a building that will open in April. On the right is a building we did uh, back a decade ago. It's the Brattleboro Food Co-op. Uh, this goes to our smart growth mission, uh, but really speaks in, in a different way to our dual goals. Uh, the food co-op uh, basically needed, was on the same site in downtown Brattleboro, had a long debate about whether to leave the community. Uh, downtown decided they should stay. And then they invited the local housing trust to build on top of them. And so 24 apartments were created in this facility. Same, they moved from a strip mall back on the river right onto the main street, restoring the streetscape. Uh, three employees of the co-op were among the original renters. So they would never have an excuse to be late for work unless they got <laughs> to the um, 
the heating system used excess heat from the refrigeration system to help heat the building along with solar power. Um, and the Brattleboro Food, Brattleboro Co-op, when they started this project, was doing about $12 million of annual sales. Um, this is, as of about three years ago, they were well past $20 million, and they source a significant amount of their food from something, several hundred farms that are, that are within 100 miles of the co-op. Uh, so it's, an, it's a great economic driver for downtown Brattleboro. Let's go on to the next slide. And it's gotten two different national awards. Um, another, several other housing revenue bond projects on the left is the primary building in downtown Bennington uh, at the crossroads of Route 7 and 9, the Putnam block that had been vacant since the 1970s um, and is now at substantial completion. We are a small part of a big economic development project uh, that I attended the opening with a, the groundbreaking with the governor and the president of the Bank of Bennington. Uh, said in his opening remarks as the leader of the Bennington Economic Development Corporation, this is a project that made no economic sense, but made all the community sense in the world. Um, it was possible in part because both the hospital and Bennington College realized that if they had a dead downtown, they were going to have a dying community and they both leased significant amounts of office space. Um, we funded just 11 micro units in the building as part of a bigger development. On the right, um, if you were in Montpelier, is the transit new transit center that has about, I can't remember, 24 to 30 apartments in it, uh, some with views of the state house, some with views of the river, um, 20 years in the planning, um, and the private builder who was going to build this pulled out at the last minute. Uh, and uh, Evernorth, you, whom you know as Housing Vermont in past years, and Down Street rebuilt, jumped into their shoes and built the building. And again, units reserved for the homeless here. Um, downtown St. Jay, the key building is undergoing a, a renovation now. The local economic development corporation is buying as a condominium all the commercial space and Ever North and Rural Edge are renovating 40 apartments there. This was among the worst slums in the state um, when it was undertaken many years of bed bug infestation. In the middle is the French block, also in Montpelier. And on the left is the snow block in Brattleboro. This is the Wilson block in Springfield uh, that is just opening as we speak. Um, Senator Clarkson, I don't know if you've been able to get down there, but I, I saw some pictures. I have. I've had, a, I've had a tour uh, just uh, in mm, October, late October, early November. And again, um, revenue bond project, uh, four units reserved for homeless youth here, along with uh, somebody who will support them um, and mixed income as all these developments are. Senator Ballant joined us for a uh, virtual groundbreaking for the Bellows Falls garage. It had a setback in um, earlier this year, but is now on its way to um, to uh, get in, in terms of the cost of this building. Mm. And uh, they thought they'd be able to save the whole structure and found that that was gonna be too costly, but uh, mm. redesign is on its way. And uh, this is the redesign and we're confident it'll be under construction this summer. And uh, we, we saw this community. on our tour. We saw That's this right, site you did walk tour, by it, like, yep. Yeah, and we it, just like we saw the one in St. Albans. Yeah. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but ec but housing is an economic driver. Um, Tom Cavett has said that in the past, that when you're trying to climb out of a recession, it creates jobs like almost nothing else will. It generates taxes, and let's just keep moving along here. Um, this is a project that we undertook, again, with the revenue bond in Hartford, um, that I think the committee uh, visited at some point or visited the site. There are 24 additional units under construction. Again, 30 apartments with 25% uh, 20, uh, of them are reserved for homeless families. Um, and again, a, additional building on its way today and highly energy efficient. One of the points that is in our statute that we're told, our board is told by you to consider is how to leverage the state's investment. 
Um, we've made a higher investment with housing revenue bond funding than we usually do. Um, and we're about 20% of this deal, but 60% of the project is coming from private equity investors using something called the low income housing tax credit. And so there's a huge amount of private investment that makes these deals happen along with some other federal programs and private lending uh, or lending through the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. So we're always looking to take what we you what we what you give us and get as much bang for the buck and create as much construction activity as possible, having the economic multipliers and the job creation that I think this committee and your colleagues have always sought. Let's keep moving, Jen. Um, we do focus a significant amount of our work on single family home ownership. I wish it were larger, um, but you've asked us repeatedly to focus on the most vulnerable Vermonters. Um, but one of the things you that a housing economist will tell you is when people are shut out of the home ownership market, it actually creates more pressure in the rental market. So the people who are at the income levels that are at the top of renters, when they're competing with very low income people for the same housing, um, they end up winning and and people with more modest incomes end up uh, in more desperate situations. Um, we do a lot of rehabilitation uh, work with our housing. This was the Champlain Housing Trust's 500th home. It was a wreck of a building uh, when we took it on um, and it is now um, a really wonderful spot with substantial rehabilitation. We've invested in about 1,200 of these homes across the state. And because we use something called shared appreciation, they have now become home to 18, more than 1,800 families. In other words, upon resale, they stay affordable. We work extensively with Habitat for Humanity. It's usually five to seven homes per year, uh, but it now totals more than 120 homes uh, across the state. Uh, so it's small but steady impact. And it is uh, perhaps the most affordable home ownership option we have because both the future homeowners and volunteers from the community help to build the homes. So except for where you need licensed trades, you get, you're getting the labor uh, greatly discounted. Uh, this is the conversion of 19 rental units at Fort Ethan Allen into home ownership, again, with us providing down payment assistance uh, and some renovation work. Let's keep moving through the show. Um, and this is a, a story of a home that we, this is the quintessential Vermont Cape in Brookline, Vermont. Um, we made a $12,000 investment in this home back in 1993. A family of four bought it. Uh, they lived there. There was a divorce. Uh, ultimately, um, the woman in her, who stayed there with her kids remarried. Uh, they sold it in 1998 uh, uh, or 2000. Uh, they got some equity out of it. A new buyer came along, um, single mom. She was there for several years. Um, she remarried. She moved on. Then a local realtor in 2005 purchased it. And you're seeing the net purchase price to the buyers uh, and the market values across the bottom of that that screen. And they were there for uh, she and her husband were there for about 15 years and sold it about three years ago. Uh, it was bought by a machinist and somebody who worked part time uh, as a teacher in daycare. Um, and they're the, they're still there today. Um, there's a, there was actually a decline in the value of the home, but because that $12,000 subsidy had grown to $60,000 um, given the way the shared appreciation works, even with a decline in market, those buyers were able to, those sellers were able to leave and get their dollars out and the equity and the, they earned some equity by having paid down their mortgage and a new family came in at $110,000. So we think this is a model that works well. Um, we also have a grant from HUD. We've, we've renewed it about 10 times now over 27 years. Um, and it has served almost, well, 2,700 homes and apartments across the state. Two thirds have been uh, owner occupied or private for profit rental properties. Um, the importance of getting lead paint, making homes lead safe 
is that it lead paint poisoning has um, a cognitive long-term impact on young children that you do not recover from. There's no cure for what you lose when you ingest lead. So really important program. Uh, we're glad to support it. It's one of those programs that we actually have to subsidize with state dollars, uh, uh, but important to bring those resources to Vermont and an example of how we're working with the private sector across the state. Um, let's move on to the next slide and Jen, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you, Gus. So part of our mission is historic preservation and we make grants um, to um, preserve um, and improve um, buildings that are available for community use around the state. We've done about 72 over our history. Um, one of the more recent ones was contributing to the, um, the renovation and preservation of um, this community center, um, the former St. Joseph School um, in um, the Old North. And, and um, um, our sense is that this is a very active place, um, providing programming and services. And um, um, I'm sure that um, all uh, people who are used to using that are probably very eager to get back to using it in the way it's fully, um, fully intended after the pandemic. Um, but we wanted to share that as an example of something we, we've also done. Um, people think of us as housing and conservation primarily, but. Um, I'm now going to run through a couple other things that the organization does um, in order to support those missions. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Just a timing question. Um, and I know Senator Rahm is pretty familiar with the work that you do, and so is all the members of the committee. Uh, we have very little time, and I'd like to focus on the, the future uh, rather than going through all the all the things that VHCB does, uh, you know, the problems we're trying to face with COVID. And I think uh, even, you know, Gus had recognized that we need to move on to that as well in the- Okay. Um, uh, All right, let me reorient then and um, talk about what we do when we think in the help with the recovery. Is that, would that be helpful? Okay. Okay, so one thing is our farm- Oh, oh, these yeah. projects are so amazing, though. You ended on a really great note with St. Joseph's, and I spend a lot of time in there at the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. So, I mean, thank you for all these projects. It's not. Oh. To, to okay. Say. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, back to COVID and CRF. So, uh, um, about 18 years ago, sorry, it's a little bit historical, et cetera, I won't dwell, um, but VHEB established a viability program to help support the enterprises and businesses that are actually working the land in most instances that is conserved. So under the theory that in order to keep um, the land that's conserved open and working well, you need the, the people who are stewarding it and caring for it to have viable businesses. So we have a farm and forest viability program that provides intensive one-on-one -on -one advising, um, business advising and financial planning assistance to enterprises. Over time, it's been a, about 850 um, businesses have enrolled in that program over the last 18 years. So um, as you can imagine, um, the pandemic has been a tremendous disruption to these businesses and uh, CRF funding was allocated by the legislature to help the program set up a rapid response business coaching program to help them access state and federal programs, um, shift to new markets, um, you know, rework their, their um, delivery systems. Um, and we are happy to report that we were able to provide that support in the last six months for more than 500 different enterprises. These businesses are gonna to continue to need support in the coming months. And they also are very much the future of what we want Vermont to be. So I want, I'm hoping the committee can think of this as a resource. VHCB out of our annual allocation provides about $800,000 a year to this program. And then they go around chasing down other federal and philanthropic funds um, in order to support the whole program. Um, so that's something that we would like to be doing more of. Um, the other thing that we, the other piece of our work that we think can help with the recovery is our uh, ready program. The Senate created this. It's specifically designed to help communities that have um, in rural areas under 5,000 in population. 
and uh, essentially what the program does is it provides grant writing assistance to help them pull in federal and philanthropic funding that might otherwise be left on the table because they don't have the capacity. Um, Sorry, somebody but, needs to mute. Okay, hang on just a second. John, can you stop doing the dishes, please? <laughs> I've never once said that in my life. <laughs> um, okay, so anyway, through the Ready Program, we provide, we help them write grants over the last three years with $225,000 to VHCB, we've secured $4.4 million for them um, in order to, uh, um, to do a variety of projects. On uh, the upper left here um, is the Clemens Farm in Addison County, um, and they received a really competitive national grant. I think it was about $300,000, $325,000 to help create a, a cultural arts and cultural center. Um, Jenna's Promise is in Johnson. It's a recovery center. Um, we helped a business in Fairfield um, move into an old Scrabble factory and uh, is now run a very um, successful run amok maple. Um, and then on the far right is a gentleman in Glover who secured a federal um, uh, value added producer grant um, through USDA. So just think of those as resources in terms of what we can do. This is a quick slide from Guilford, Vermont that shows how all the different things we do can come together when there's strong local leadership affordable housing, um, a community center, the restoration of the local general store, and preserving um, the Green River that restores floodplain um, and habitat. So I'm going to keep moving along quickly. Hey, Dan, this is Becca. Can I just say, yeah. uh, Katie, Katie Buckley was really instrumental in mm -hmm. helping revitalize the, uh, the country store there and just like to give her a little, little plug. She's still doing really good work in southern Vermont. So... Absolutely. You know, I, um, the state, state money in Montpelier is great, but it, you really can't make much happen unless there's strong local leadership. And Katie was fantastic down there in Guilford. And that's, and they, they, for a small town, have really pulled in a lot of resources to strengthen yeah. their community. She, she is a force of nature. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hand it back over to Gus about what more we'd like to be able to do. So as you can see in this slide, um, there is a lot more for us to do. And I guess I would just say that as you think about your economic development and your housing missions, we are a place that it comes together. Um, uh, there's clearly a long, long pipeline of projects that we can be doing all over the state. I think Senator, that Mr. Chairman, that's why you've been so interested in um, doing another uh, bond for housing. Um, I would just say to you, as, as Jen has just indicated, that our conservation programs are also contributing to economic recovery. Um, you know, historic sites like the Daisy Turner Homestead is important to our, both to our heritage and to our travel and tourism, as is a, a site like the Clemens Farm. But even with our farmland work, um, and this goes to the generational demographic challenges, half of the time that we conserve a, a farm, it's to promote an intergenerational transfer to deal with a demographic challenge of Vermont. And, and young people are using the sale of development rights as a way to get um, to get onto into farm ownership. So it's really important. But there, in every direction we look, whether it's rental housing, recovery housing, the need for mobile home park investment. Uh, Senator Ballant is well aware of our work with Tri Park. There's just tremendous need for us to continue to attack it. One of the problems with the current federal package that you will undoubtedly discover is we're grateful that there is a huge amount, $200 million of rental assistance. We only spent $25 million for rental assistance out of the CRF funding, um, but um, and it'll be a challenge to use all $200 million. There's apparently more in the, in the president's next proposal. There's nothing to provide for capital um, for housing. And so to get to that question of balance uh, and providing more units, we're going to need your help. Uh, and I think there are two ways to do that. And one is by impressing upon the federal delegation that we need more help, but the other is to work with your colleagues. And this is our I think our very last slide, or not quite the closing slide, but the transfer tax. Um, I sat in the Senate Finance Committee when it was raised back in our second year of existence when Act 200 was passed. It was 
passed primarily because it would be a barometer of what's going on in the real estate market. And pressure in the real estate market upward makes housing and land harder for people of more modest means to access. Uh, this data is provided uh, through the Housing Finance Agency. And what it shows you is that there is a great increase, and this is a few months old uh, through October, in homes selling above $300,000, $400,000, and $500,000. That's what's generating the increase. We should probably think about this as a one-time or maybe two-year phenomena. And I would say to you that we are a great place to park one-time dollars uh, if we do a lot as we did uh, with the revenue bond. Uh, we make these investments and we don't have to, you can decide to ratchet it back. Uh, yesterday, there was new data on the transfer tax projections. It went up another $5 million. And what that would mean if it could be allocated to us is last year our budget was $17 million, both between the transfer tax and the capital bill. Uh, it would go up to $27 million. I know there'll be other competition and other need that Senator Ballant and everybody in appropriations is going to be asked to address. But I, I guess I think this is a moment at which uh, recognizing what an, the increased value of homes and land means for people who are squeezed out of the market, this is a time to invest in in our work. So we'll stop there, um, uh, except to say, as we said a few minutes ago, that the numbers of Vermonters who are homeless as a result of the economic fallout and the pandemic is stubbornly high, and we need more supply to address it. We need to do some other things as well, uh, and we'll, we will get rental assistance from the feds, it seems, to help address that, at least for the short term. Thank Terrific. You. Um, any questions for Gus or Jen? Um, so I have one comment. Uh, Senator Brock, did you have your hand up? You're yes. muted, Randy. You're muted. I do have just a, a general question not to be answered immediately, but I wonder uh, if uh, the VHCB could just provide us with a list of the projects uh, housing projects that you've done this year uh, with the number of units uh, that are provided in each and then the total cost uh, for each of those projects, uh, including uh, uh, specifically the cost of public funds that went into the project in addition to total cost. That would be just very helpful to try to digest what we're getting. Yeah, we will give you that with our annual report, Senator. Good, it's always in the annual report. So you will have that. And if- When, if when will that be up, by the way? It, it's due to you the end of the month, at okay. the end of January. Um, Good, and if there, if there are more questions, please um, let's explore them all. I will say, Senator, and you, know, you have been um, sometimes asked us hard questions about cost. Because of the nature of the properties that we needed to acquire to meet the six month deadline, we did this primarily at the low end uh, compared to what you're used to. So most of those projects are well under $200,000 a unit. Um, Good. Okay, thank you. Senator Clarkson. So um, Gus and Jen, thank you. This was terrific. And um, as you know, this is a committee that's completely dedicated to your mission and uh, very, very supportive of this work. And we just applaud how much you got done in such a short window of time. Which leads me to my first question, which is um, with the extension, uh, the federal extension of spending some of this money, uh, how many more projects might be able to be swept in under this? And as we look at FEMA dollars replacing some of the CRF and being able to use some of our other money more flexibly, what, what do you see that enabling? Well, we turned back about $1.3 million uh, at the beginning of December. Uh, and depending on who one talks to, the administration certainly considers those dollars to have been reallocated. Uh, there were two projects in particular that um, the developers just had to give up on. One was in St. Albans, another in Rutland, because they were sure they there was no way to meet the December 30th deadline. Um, so were those dollars to be reallocated uh, and with 
another year to spend them, we could, I'm sure, find ways to do that. Um, there is much less flexibility in the new package than there was right. in the RF package. And that's yeah. one of the, uh, as we learn more about it, and you know, we're all hoping that in another week, there'll be better treasury guidance than the guidance that's come out so far. There might be a little bit more flexibility. Um, even the rental assistance program, I'm sure you're about to hear from Richard Williams, is far more restrictive than what the, we could do with a CRF funding. So we have challenges ahead. I know the congressional delegation will be happy to work and push for more flexibility from the feds. Gus, could I add that, um, and as you said, they're going to hear from Richard Williams later, and the need for rental assistance is, is, is tremendous. Um, we all have, to the extent the legislature could let Richard know how much he can have and let him get up and going would be fantastic. He's really, it's gonna be um, administratively much more challenging than the last time around. And whatever isn't um, set to be used uh, by September will be reallocated to other states. So we know there's a need for rental assistance and to the extent the legislature can let him know early on that he's gonna have a certain amount to work with and can get going, it's gonna help the state be more successful particularly with the tight strings that are around it, because it's going to take a while for those to change. Yeah, I, I double down on that urging that right. move that as quickly as possible and keep it moving, because if people are unable to pay rent, um, it it's a problem both for them and for the landlords, even with an eviction moratorium in place. Um, uh, I have a, a comment, uh, Gus. So you mentioned uh, this committee, my interest in the first housing revenue bond and promoting a second housing revenue bond. Uh, I'm putting in another bill, as you know, with a second revenue bond, several committee members have sponsored. I'm not naive as to the hurdles that faces, but uh, we're very big into leveraging and matching and and uh, trying to get the most bang for our buck early on. That's why the first housing bond was so attractive to me, uh, even though it took a million or $2 million from your annual appropriation to pay the debt service, it got $37 million up front and out to build housing now, as opposed to what that one or $2 million could do over the next 20 years. So I'm looking to you guys to, figure out any other creative ways to get money upfront and leveraged uh, given the uh, where we are and what the federal government is doing. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna have all kinds of ideas how to do this extra money that's coming in housing assistance. And I think you are very good at seeing the overall picture and, and leveraging money and matching funds. And so I'm looking for ideas from you folks uh, as soon as you can get them to us. Okay. I, I guess I would just say, Senator, I would com be completely supportive, uh, much to the chagrin of the treasurer of another bond. Um, given what the transfer tax is doing at this moment, if there were a way to capture an extra $10 million a year for the next two years, for housing, that might be a good way to go as well. Um, and I think we should just look at it because this is right. not likely a phenomena that would last. And I think that there, there is a great case to be made that we should capture this revenue and reinvest it um, because because it's a reflection again of, of an upward pressure in the real estate market that will be, make it harder for people to buy housing, make housing less affordable, make land less accessible as well. Well, and may I just say, given I'm one of the top 10 towns where this has happened, uh, less houses sold, but at much higher value, totally squeezing out full-time residents, uh, that, that, which is also a, a, a challenge that we're facing, which puts additional pressure on schools and education funding with fewer kids. I mean, we're, you know, we're just being gutted by seasonal residents. And, and we're not clear that they're all many saying, oh, we're going to come sometime full time and oh, it's remote work now. But, you know, it's it's unclear as this sugars out how many will become full time residents. And anyway, 
it's it's a phenomenon that is a real a huge challenge. So that reinvestment of that 10 million in full time affordable housing in communities that no longer have any affordable housing is incredibly important. OK, um, uh, for the people who are new to the committee or witnesses, we're now taking 10 minute breaks on the half hour. So we will oh, break on the hour on the half hour. We're oh, now, yeah. oh, right. I see we're now um, at 9.35, we'll reconvene at 9.45, and we'll start with Richard Williams. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you that was great. Okay. Um, I guess we're at 9.45, so we're ready to go, Nathan, and we are still live. And um, we're going to talk about the rental housing subsidy program which was run by the Vermont State Housing Authority. Uh, so Richard, I, there you are. Hi, Richard. Um, why don't you give us uh, an update from September? You can also give us a little bit of the historical background uh, to refresh our memory and for our new member and tell us where we are and what you see as a need going forward. And I assume that you better than anybody might have a bit of a handle on what was passed in December in Washington, what we might see from the Biden administration and what your needs are, what holes you've seen other than just continuing the program, what tweaks you might want to make to the program. Um, so I'll leave it to you to go forward. Thank you, Richard. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Richard Williams. I'm the executive director of the Vermont State Housing Authority. I've also asked Kathleen Burke uh, to join me today. Uh, Kathleen is the, uh, uh, the director of the uh, rental administration of, 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 our, of our rental assistance programs. Uh, I just I want to thank all the returning members to your committee and, and your newest member. Uh, look, look forward to working with everyone. and. Uh, and this committee's uh, been very supportive to this agency in the past, and I know uh, you will continue to be uh, because housing is in your name. So uh, yes, let's begin. Uh, Rental Housing Stabilization Program um, was uh, uh, just a little background, was contained in a bill called H-966, uh, and it was related to COVID-19 funding for assistance for broadband connectivity, housing, economic relief. And it was signed into law by Governor Scott on July 2nd. Vermont State Housing Authority launched uh, its program on Monday, July 13th. Uh, the rental housing stabilization program provided uh, rental rearage uh, to the landlord uh, for the actual amount owed by the tenant or the VSHA payment standards, which we uh, established for the uh, Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, whichever was less. Uh, you know, the, the household and the unit had to meet certain eligibility uh, criteria, but the primary goal, if you recall, of this program was to keep Vermonters housed during this public health emergency by allowing them to keep their rented homes by granting back rent funds and avoiding termination of tenancy, court evictions, and homelessness. The secondary goal uh, was to compensate landlords for some of their losses due to the CARES Act, uh, judicial emergencies, and stay of eviction proceedings. So the uh, rental housing stabilization program uh, was active for six months. Uh, and has paid out uh, $21,119,000. Uh, currently, the Vermont State Housing Authority is out of money uh, for that particular program. Uh, I will give you a little history. Uh, uh, we were appropriated additional uh, money, uh, but in October, uh, we were required to uh, assess the program and look at the expenditures uh, because we had a requirement to report back uh, to the administration uh, on the progress of the uh, program uh, to date. At that time, uh, we honestly didn't think that we were gonna spend our full, full appropriation. Uh, we actually thought uh, there would be $3 million in reserve. Therefore, the uh, agency of administration uh, recaptured uh, through the uh, 
Agency of Commerce and Community Development and recaptured that $3 million. And then uh, in November and December, the applications just ramped up way beyond expectations. Uh, at the same time, you know, this program was running, uh, working with our partners, Vermont Legal Aid, Vermont Landlords Association. We were continually modifying this program uh, to include as many low-income households uh, members in various different uh, situations. And uh, and that in those in those organizations, uh, you know, really did a great job uh, helping us with stipulation agreements, uh, which were arranged uh, between attorneys to settle back rent disputes out of the court. Otherwise, it would have led to eviction once the moratorium was was lifted. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but I believe you know prior to COVID, there was over 600. Uh, cases pending before Vermont courts uh, regarding evictions. Uh, I know that our next uh, speakers can, can confirm those details. We also, uh, almost in like the last month and a half, came up with a new way to spend money. Uh, and that was a motion to dismiss. And what we were using was 12 VSA 4773, which provides a renter a way to have a non-payment eviction case discontinued if the renter pays into court all the rent due through the end of the current rental period, including interest and cost of suit. So uh, that's where uh, uh, there was a case. Uh, it was based on uh, rent arrearage. And uh, through all the reaching out, uh, we're still not able to settle those cases. So we worked out a, an arrangement with Vermont Legal Aid where we paid that amount into their escrow account and then they, in turn, paid that into the court uh, to dismiss the case. Vermont Landlord Association uh, uh, started up a mediation services uh, program. Uh, that was late in, our, in the program, but uh, I thought it was successful. Uh, and Angela will be able to uh, tell you how many cases that, uh, that was settled through that process, but uh, I thought that was a great pilot program. I don't want to really dwell on, uh, you know, a lot of the report. I, I did post it up for the committee. I also votes, uh, posted up the uh, a landlord survey that we sent out about a week or week and a half or so ago. And at that time, there was about over 500 uh, landlords had responded to our survey out of, I believe, around 1,600 uh, that we had sent out to people to uh, landlords that have participated in our program, and overall the uh, uh, those uh, the information that we gathered through that uh, was that we really were able to reach out to the private landlord lord or or the property manager. Now this is based on responses, of course. So, but ninety three percent of the responses said that they were uh, a landlord, a private landlord, and of those there was uh, of those responses. 49% of them uh, responded that they only owned, owned uh, one to four units. Uh, there was another 16% uh, that uh, owned between five and 10. So you can see that we really did reach down to the private landlord and that was a goal of this particular program uh, to you know, provide some, some economic relief. So as I said, we, we spent $21,119,000. Uh, we were asked to come before the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee uh, uh, last Thursday about this particular program. And uh, they asked, uh, uh, asked us at that time uh, about the program and we informed them that we have 1,500 applications uh, currently that we are unable to fund. And it appears that that is about $2.8 million. So uh, I think there may be some activity on that this week. Uh, it sounded like the, uh, the committee was going to move that request forward. Uh, what that would enable us to do is to uh, process the remaining applications as we cut the, uh, cut the application off on December 11th, uh, because at that time, uh, there was no extension uh, of the program. So we needed to, uh, and 
process those applications uh, because we were we had a December 20th deadline looming on us uh, to return any money uh, that we had spent uh, to the uh, agency of administration. Uh, so, Richard, Richard, app I'm Richard sorry. Um, how much were you spending in the last couple of months per month on the program? Uh, I can tell you the uh, the average payment uh, was about two thousand, a little over two thousand dollars was the average payment uh, that was made to a landlord. Uh, I can shuffle some uh, paper here and. Uh, I'm just trying to get at how much money you need until, um, let's say, town meeting day, till we can get a budget adjustment act signed by the governor uh, to, to, to come up with an appropriate amount that gives you cover for the how long you need it for. So I, th I think you're thinking a different track than maybe than I was, uh, was approaching. Uh, I was thinking that we would close out this particular program, Senator, uh, uh, by requesting additional $2.8 million that would that would uh, get clear the applications that we have here. And then we would uh, look to the new program uh, that the state of Vermont will be receiving the, the $200 million that will be uh, for a small state minimum for Vermont. And we would use that new program uh, to, uh, for future, you know, right. future well, payments. But wouldn't that lead to a, a, a gap? I mean, aren't you, all things being equal, wouldn't you need money in the month of January to help pay back rent? And by the time you get that con that money in, it may be March or April. That is that is true, Senator. Uh, but uh, that would mean that we would have to open up and start taking applications again uh, because we can only process what we have in house right now. So that would mean that would you know a continuation of the current program uh, using. Uh, well, CRF well, funds, I believe. Right. Well, I mean, I want to. I want to think outside the box here. I mean, we know there's going to be a ton of money for back rent. Why should we artificially stop the program and start it up? Why can't right. we figure out a way to keep it going? Yeah, and, and may I tag on to that, Mr. Chair? Yes. The, go ahead. The, uh, I'd also love to get a sense of your understanding of the timing of the 200 million, because it does strike me once we've set up a program that there's no reason to artificially end it, that we could continue to fund that aspect of it uh, with these new dollars. So I guess the, one of the questions is when are we see, seeing those $200 million? I don't have an exact date on that. I think uh, Commissioner Hanford, uh, probably has a better understanding of that. Uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, the agency of administration submitted a request, um, I think it was last Monday or maybe it was the Monday before, uh, and that a large percentage of that money will start flowing into the state. At that time, I was under the impression it was like 30 days that uh, Vermont could start receiving some of that money. And then there's a, uh, uh, then there's yeah. going to be a time period uh, to actually set up a new program because the new rules and regulations, the new program are just, uh, I don't want to be discouraging, but they, we saw some, uh, we saw the current treasury's uh, uh, FAQs yesterday coming out and uh, it's going to really slow down the processing of the applications, uh, sadly, because uh, they're running it uh, very close to what a HUD uh, federal rental assistance program uh, would be where we would need to verify income and and uh, and and determine that it was COVID related. You know, under this current program, we as as you know, you gave us a, a, a fair amount of flexibility. We were able yeah. to go back prior to March 31st uh, to landlords. Uh, to because as I said, this was a public health and no one wanted to see anyone um, lose, their, lose their housing or become homeless. So we had a lot of flexibility. That flexibility is not going to be there with the new program, at least currently under the current uh, outgoing treasurer's uh, determination. 
we're, we're all hopeful that in the next few weeks, uh, we may see uh, whatever uh, flexibility that the new administration may have. I mean, the act is the act, uh, which is the guardrails uh, for spending the money. Uh, I'm not sure how much flexibility a new administration will have with that, because uh, uh, most of it appears statutory to me. Uh, so, that, so it would appear that they would need to go back and, and get an amendment to this act to make changes. I mean, we originally thought there would be uh some flexibility uh not as much as the current program but now it's it seems i, I just don't i don't want to really be a you know really negative on it but right now uh, uh that's that's the way i feel is because uh of what i saw yesterday it's it's going to take a longer to process this uh, the required documentation as you know uh vermont uh has challenges with internet and broadband and a lot of the folks that we serve lower income households don't have access to good good service or you know have to go to a local library you know to try to submit information uh, and that 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 will be a challenge uh, under the old program that we're just wrapped up uh, you know it was uh, self-certification on, on most of the documents that we needed so uh, I would have to, you know, think about this and you know talk with with folks, uh, Senator, to see if there's a way to 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 move this forward under the current current program. But um, I'm not seeing that right now. So, but I will certainly delve into that for you. Okay. Uh, so I, I guess one question I have: there has been talk of fifty million or ten million dollars going forward. That would have been under the new program. Yes. I had asked uh, the Senate Appropriations get, uh, Committee. Well, they the Senate Appropriations Committee brought that up, and uh, they, you know, basically were uh, looking to see uh, if I had any guidance for their uh, committee. And I asked them, uh, based upon what we spent on this program, twenty five million uh, for six months, I thought it was a reasonable request to ask for fifty million as a placeholder. And then I uh, have heard that there was another number. Uh, of 10 million that had been uh, projected. But uh, I can tell you that's that's probably not enough money for us to set up the new program because uh, we're looking at a new total new platform uh, to process the applications. And that's close to $500,000. And uh, last year, if you recall, uh, we were appropriated, uh, uh, well, through ACCD, we received uh, looks like eight hundred seventy-five thousand uh, dollars to cover our staff costs uh, for this current program. This program appears to be much more expensive to to administer. We've been uh, Kathleen and I have been on uh, many national uh, conference calls, listening to other states as to what uh, they're anticipating. And uh, so we've reached out to some vendors and we're having those conversations. We're, we're hoping to be uh, ready to go, but $10 million, uh, I don't think will cover the uh, administrative costs because we believe we're gonna need to work with other entities, uh, not only landlords associations and, and Vermont Legal Aid, but I think we will need to work with with uh, you know, advocates for the elderly, advocates for low-income households to help them prepare the applications to submit it because there's so much documentation that will be needed. And, uh, uh, I, I think don't, I don't right. think I don't think uh, Richard that uh, I mean we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. I don't think people have in any way come down as to what the amount that's needed for the program. I don't think the ten million dollars, to the extent that's been suggested in any way represents the total program costs. It's just a placeholder to right. move the for program forward. We have several vehicles like the Budget Adjustment Act and the budget itself to put more money in to get the, the number correctly. So I wouldn't be concerned that people are, are shortchanging this program. But um, in terms of the 2.8, you're saying that that's to take care of people's back rent for since you shut the program off and through December 30th. And that's the only um, 
money you could ask for essentially right now out of the old CARES funding. You couldn't pay with the extension that was given uh, in spending the money. You still can't pay for January rent, for instance, for anybody. So this would cover the uh, all the applications. As, as I mentioned, we uh, uh, the program was terminated on December 11th. So the applications I'm referring to are the ones that we have in-house that were received by that deadline. Uh, it does not include monies going forward from December 11th to the 31st. But could that be could that be paid for with CARES funding? Uh, that's another question I think that uh, would have to be answered by uh, Commissioner Hanford, uh, because we understood there was uh, restrictions. I don't know if those have gone away, but there were restrictions about paying January rent. Uh, we were able to pay that uh, some January rent for tenants that were forced to move for whatever reason. We were able, as long as they had entered into a lease prior to December 31st, uh, for the 1st of uh, January, we were able to uh, make payments on their behalf. I'm not sure if we can uh, continue that into January now because of the new program, but we certainly can We can find that out. So we, we, we do have uh, Josh on our agenda today, I believe. Uh, Senator Rahm. Um, I think Richard started to answer my question, but I, I was just struck um, when I heard about the utility bill program and forgiveness there that, you know, people had to kind of fill out a form. And so like, for example, in Burlington Electric, there was only 20% uptake. So just trying to get a sense of, you know, people are so underwater and so burdened right now. It sounds like you can just do this without much paperwork or, or ways that this could st get stopped up and people could not get the help. You can just sort of apply this to their what's owed or how much do people need to participate? Are you talking, uh, Senator, are you talking about the current program or the future program? I guess both, you know, has, has there been barriers that you'd like to see addressed in the new program that come from the federal government? Uh, well, the new program is a lot of barriers, uh, you know, it's, and it's going to be very complicated for, for no matter what income level you are, it's still going to be complicated. Uh, there will be restrictions on the use of the, the future funds. It has to be for uh, at incomes at or below 80% of medium income. It also has to be a preference towards 50% medium of income or below. So, you know, the means testing is will take time. We're looking, hopefully, you know, uh, that we may be able to, and you folks may be able to help us out uh, because we're gonna need information uh, in order to process these new applications with this this new million, uh, this $200 million that's coming in and uh, whatever portion we, we may receive of that. Uh, so, you know, we currently have some uh, memorandums of understanding with Department of Labor, you know, uh, you know, for our federal rental assistance program. We also have a memorandum of understanding with Agency of Human Service so we can, uh, again, with our Section 8 voucher program, so we can uh, verify eligibility, verify in income fairly quickly. Uh, part of this is also uh, the new program. They, wanna, they want verification of, uh, uh, the 2020 income and that's going to be difficult uh, because many people that are very on low income don't even submit uh, a tax uh, form and and also the filing date of you know obviously april 15th so those are look like huge delays to us right now and uh and also very complicated to get that information so that's why i, th I think what the funding that we would get uh, would increase, would have, what I would propose would, incur, would in, involve other agencies uh, to help us get this, uh, to package up applications, to get them in, and then we would compensate those agencies uh, on their behalf. If under this current program, if you remember, you actually broke that out a little bit differently. Uh, Agency of Human Services uh, uh, received uh, direct allocation and then the ACCD received uh, 
fundings, you know, for this particular program, also for the Landlords Association, uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency received a portion of that as well. And there was money set aside for the uh, Department of Housing Community Affairs to administer a rental rehab uh, program. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, Senator, or, or just probably I'm just- uh, No, it's helpful. You know, just, uh, you know, you're seeing my personal reflections on, on after seeing these uh, uh, guidelines yesterday, so. Right. It, it, it just looks like a huge burden, uh, administrative burden overlay on a program that you would design that got money out the door fast with modest, uh, with modest administrative overlay. And it's just, it's so frustrating to see the feds uh, burden this with uh, with these additions but we'll hope the treasury guidance changes uh in due course on the on the other hand it's not unusual to see subsidy programs mean tested and, oh, yeah. um, and i'm wondering whether there's a part of me that says there's people who are lower income have greater needs here obviously and to target the money to those folks. So I'm wondering whether you have any evidence in terms of your metrics or whatever, what, of what the income distribution might be or anecdotally what you see in the existing program, have people who have clearly could have afforded their rent come and taken resources, perhaps from other people who needed it more in your program? We certainly, uh... I believe we'll be able to document that for you. Uh, we're currently working on uh, uh, finalizing this report and there'll be a lot of graphs to show it to you, but I can tell you uh, from what we were seeing is uh, these are low-income households that are receiving this benefit, no doubt about it. And, and Mr. Chair, I, I, from all, all we've heard in our housing community that, that, that there's huge need for that next bump up. I mean, that next group up, I mean, I completely agree with you on, on, on low income, uh, uh, our lowest income households, but there's been huge pressure on that next group of, of, of still what one would consider low income. It just isn't as low as this threshold that's been set by the feds. My other uh, concern, Senator, uh, is with this new program, there's uh, these deadlines uh, that um, Sixty-five percent of this money has to be spent by the end of September. Right. And uh, therefore, I'm. Uh, we're looking at other particular programs, and I, I'm. I'm assuming that you folks will be t as well uh, to see if there's other ways to chunk out uh, big portions of this this uh, appropriation, and to possibly could use be used for. You know, bumping up, uh, you know, the TANF supports for housing. Uh, also, uh, you know, finding a way to use this money to support, you know, the over 2,000 homeless folks that we still have in motels. Um, I know there's been programs for vouchers uh, to help the homeless, uh, but uh, I think you will probably, if you haven't already heard testimony, uh, people are struggling to use the vouchers, even if they have the voucher. As you know, we have a huge lack of affordable housing here in Vermont. And uh, unfortunately, that this particular program uh, that uh, is coming in really and doesn't look like it's going to be able to do much for, for that situation. Looking ahead, you know, to the, uh, uh, the current uh, uh, president elect, I think uh, for a few more minutes, uh, has proposed a, a substantial amount of money, as you know, a $1.9 trillion uh, budget. Uh, in that, uh, there is a proposal uh, for additional vouchers. Again, uh, that's good. That's I think it, that goes a long ways to support permanent affordable housing, housing because we, Vermont State Housing has already uses its vouchers. Uh, in many different creative ways, but we also use them for what we call project-based vouchers. And we've been successful in using, working with our for-profit developers and nonprofit developers uh, to use those project-based vouchers and, and uh, 
in coordination with the Vermont Housing Finance Agency's uh, Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And we've created a lot of really uh, deep affordable housing using those for very low income households that normally probably wouldn't get into that type of housing because without rental assistance, uh, even at the ver uh, low income housing tax credit rent, many of them are not able to, to pay the basic rent uh, for the unit. So uh, we are looking forward to that, as, but uh, as you know, that has a long ways to go, uh, but it's, it does contain 28 billion for 500,000 new housing choice vouchers. Uh, it also uh, contains some legal aid resources and other rent protections to help renters avoid evictions. It's, uh, his, uh, his proposal uh, has a three billion emergency solution grants to help prevent and respond to outbreaks uh, amongst those that are experiencing homelessness. And there's $44 billion for the National Housing Trust Fund. So, you know, who knows what's going to happen, but uh, it, it looks encouraging, but we all know that uh, it's got a long ways to go uh, before we'll see that money. So my, uh, my goal here for this committee is for us to be an integral part of the decision making uh, and try and anticipate the kinds of challenges we had last time around where money had to go out the door so fast that we had to give so much discretion to the administration, not only on housing, but an economic recovery. And we may find ourselves in that situation as well. But Richard has sent me, I don't know, 10 days ago or something, a list similar to some of the stuff he's just saying of all these creative ideas of how we might be able to spend this money. I mean, $200 million is a lot of money. It sounds like we're going to double that with the Biden proposal. Um, so what I'm going to ask Josh Hanford to do is to sort of convene a, a group, if he doesn't already have one, and keep us in writing, informed on a weekly basis of all the ideas you're considering and um, the guidelines you're getting from the federal government. So we don't have to keep having you back every week to know what's going on. So when the time comes to make a decision to design this program, the five members of this committee can have some input on what that looks like and what the guardrails are around those programs. So we just don't get stuck and say, all right, do whatever you can do. And I don't, I, I'd like not to be in that situation. That's not the way the legislature should function. So, um, uh, let me, uh, I appreciate your time, Richard. We've got a couple more witnesses before our next break. Uh, let me turn it over to uh, Jean. And uh, is it Jean or Jean? <laughs> Jean. You're muted. Uh, it's Jean, Jean Murray. Okay. Jean, thank you once again for being here. Um, so I'm interested in your perspective on how uh, the program has worked, and I'm specifically uh, interested in knowing how it went with the agreements and protections against rent increases and evictions that came along with landlords getting this back rent paid. Um, thank you. Um, for the record, I am Jean Murray. I'm a staff attorney at Vermont Legal Aid. Um, I've been at Vermont Legal Aid for 23 years um, and have worked uh, since the last time we met on this program as well as the eviction moratorium. And so I wanna thank this committee for the support um, that uh, came for housing issues uh, that allowed us to basically keep people housed um, in Vermont uh, during these last six months. Um, one of the things that I, I want to say is that this rental housing stabilization program under H966 was enacted on July 2nd and was taking applications on July 13th. And that meant that Vermont State Housing Authority had to immediately gear up, create an application, start figuring out how to process applications, and then... Uh, um, they have been 
working <laughs> incredibly long hours, uh, very hard, very focused, very concentrated for the last six months in order to um, process the applications and uh, take applications that are really going to amount to $25 million. That's been a tremendous amount of work and they've worked very hard. So if I were thinking about what to do with new money, I would start now. Um, I think Angela would agree with me. Vermont Legal Aid needed to staff up in order to do its part. That takes a little bit of time. The staff that we had through December 30th, um, because we couldn't promise them uh, that there would be a program after December 30th, they've moved on. We, we will have to rehire to do our parts. Um, we also need to be earlier in the effort, outreach effort to get to community agencies and train them about what the new program will be so that they will be available to help us. So um, when we're talking about what um, is needed now, um, in addition to paying off the pending applications, we need to really start trying to figure out now how Vermont State Housing Authority can staff up, Vermont Legal Aid, Vermont Landlords Association, and the partnership that we put together to be able to distribute the money that we did. Um, you asked about how well did this program work to prevent evictions? Um, once Vermont State Housing Authority gets its final tally um, with its spreadsheet, we will be, we will request information from the judiciary data from them about pending cases and cases that were pending last March. And we'll cross check um, because what I think is of the 600 cases that were eviction cases that were pending last March, a number of them became resolved because um, the parties accessed the rent payment. And one of the things, one of the conditions for accessing the rent payment was to agree to uh, drop or, or cease or stop any current eviction cases. And we believe quite a number of people did that without lawyers helping them, whatever. They just got the payment and dropped the case. Um, the other thing I know is that in a regular year, about 150 eviction cases get filed per month. The moratorium allows uh, landlords to file cases, but they're filed and then they're stopped right there, if you recall. So this year, um, since March, instead of 150 cases a month being filed, only about 50, actually less than that, cases per month statewide got filed. So new evictions were very much slowed by the possibility of uh, landlords getting payments um, because about 70, 75% of all eviction cases are for non-payment. And once you take that away, um, then there's no need for an eviction case. So um, we do think that um, being able to have rent paid really reduced the number of eviction cases in the court. Um, we want to be able to do that cross check thing um, once we get all the final data in so that we can actually give numbers. Um, in terms of um, slowing rent increases, um, the, the provision of the rental housing stabilization program said, had the landlords promising not to increase the rent before January 1st. And I think that basically worked. Um, we got a lot of applications in in the last two months um, Richard, uh, I don't know if you said this, but you got a thousand applications in in the last two days. So um, the prohibition against increasing the rent, not increasing the rent until January 1st became less and less important. Um, I think uh, uh, my written testimony, I start from what did we learn that we didn't know? One thing is we, I learned, which was a revelation for me, is that um, landlords and tenants, once the financial tension is taken away, they can really work very well together. They are supportive of each other. Uh, 
they work together in this crisis to um, keep people housed and afloat. Um, the other thing that became, that was revealed to me is that there are a lot of landlords um, who financially carry their tenants um, through the year. I, I more or less realized that before um, because a lot of times um, at tax time when tenants are getting their tax refund and their earned income tax credit, they go back and pay a few months rent. Um, and there are, there are uh, several occasions, um, well, that is one uh, during the year and in between landlords carry tenants. Um, we tend to think about problems in landlord tenant law as um, cats and dogs, they're fighting all the time. But as a matter of fact, this experience proved that that's not true, that landlords and tenants, the majority of them cooperate all the time. Um, I have studied the, the new um, statute coming from the federal government. Um, and one of the problems is going to be delay. So as Richard was saying, that, the, that statute says that if by December, 65% of the 200 million isn't committed, then the Secretary of the Treasury can take it back and, and send it to states where it is committed. I don't know whether or not it's possible to spend $200 million on back rent between now and September, but I do know it will be a lot harder um, given that we won't even be able to start doing that for now a month or two. Um, and so again, I guess the thing that I wanna reiterate is if we can begin to understand in advance what it's going to take administratively to uh, run the program and start doing that now, even before we get the dollars to spend um, giving rent and utility money out. Um, I so think- me, Can I ask you a, a couple of questions? Um, sure. In terms of outreach, on this program, uh, do you think it, in, in the low income community, it was widely known that this benefit was out there? That's one question what the take up rate uh, might be. And how does the program work in terms of if somebody applied in July and got their back rent paid can they keep applying monthly and every month get their month, let the rent go in arrears for a month and put another application in and get another uh, month's rent? Those are two questions I have. Yeah, so for the program we just finished, the one that ended December 30th, um, reapplication was allowed. And we also said that um, the program said that rent had to be in arrears in order to apply. Um, so in other words, if your rent is due on September 1st, you can apply for September's rent on September 5th. That nuance, I don't know how well it was known. Um, I do know that many tenants and landlords applied more than once. Um, and uh, sometimes it was sort of the, uh, that, that people hadn't really figured out the best scheme for applying and so could have gotten more money from the program, but didn't because of the, the dates that they were applying. Um, the new program will be allowed to um, pay rent in advance. So it won't need to be in arrears in order to be eligible for the program. Uh, it, the person, the tenant household applying will need to show that they have the financial need um, and some other uh, things that need to show. And I can't really say enough how much different that will be administratively than what we uh, just did. Uh, Al, I, uh, Senator Clarkson. Well, before you go, Senator Clarkson, uh, I'd like you to give some thought and uh, maybe some investigation it sounds like we're, we may benefit significantly for some bridge funding to get the next program 
up and running quickly. And one area that I was exploring last year, which I'm, I didn't make any headway, but I think it's still fertile ground is that we have like 11 or $9 million in the rent or rebate program that I can't imagine is gonna have as much demand on it given the $25 million that has been put in to help people pay their rent and they're very similar populations. So there may be some excess general funds. I think they go to the Ed Fund, uh, but the Ed Fund is now seeing an infusion of money that we might be able to take or borrow from to jumpstart some of the work you're talking about. So I think we should look at that. And you represent people that probably uh, apply to both programs. And I'm wondering if you could find out whether there's less pressure on the, on the rent or rebate program now that people have far less rent to pay. So uh, that's something. You don't have to answer that now, but you know any kind of exploration you can do on that would be helpful. Senator Clarkson. You're muted. You're muted. I'm pulling a Sorotkin. Um, we we got to get rid of that, rid of that refrain, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's endearing. It's yeah, endearing. but you do it just as much as he does. So it's not oh, fair. I, I, I'm trying so hard to mute myself because as you all know, those of you who I work with, the temptation to leap into the conversation is very hard to restrain. No, I, so I'm trying to be I, really good. I, I actually don't mind the tag. It is endearing. Anyway, the, the idea that rent can be paid prospectively is one that's possibly very attractive given um, how much money we're getting. And the question I have for you is, as we go into these discussions with Treasury, is like, how far? in advance could we be uh, paying rent? And could, could it be like a whole year or two years or, or whatever? I mean, it would be, I mean, that may be part of the creative solution that we look at just saying. And the other tag I'd like to put, just like Senator Sorotkin just put that tag in um, about the rental rebate program, I'd like to put in the tag for another conversation about challenges within our eviction stays, because all of us as uh, senators have faced nagging challenges with, with rental situations that are unhealthy um, and, and, and are violating the sort of spirit of the stay. And uh, I'd like to put a stake in the ground for that conversation. Uh, I know Angela has been working really hard on a lot of these with landlords. I hear great things about working and I've also gotten people from uh, Jean's. So we're, we're getting it from both sides and would love that conversation to continue uh, to, to, for us to have that conversation a little later. But so my, yeah. Um, in answer to what the new um, federal law seems to be able to say is that uh, rent can be paid for 12 months and up to 15 months if uh, the state determines the need for doing that, but it must only be granted in three month in increments. And oh. on top of that, if the way the person proved their financial eligibility for the grant in the first place was based on their current income, as opposed to their whole previous 2020 income, then every three months, that group of people is going to have to verify their income as well as their need for the next three months. So everybody in the program has to verify that they need the program for another three months. And a percentage of those people are also gonna to have to financially verify every three months, which is why it is going to be such a huge administrative burden. But um, the program could uh, give a subsidy, you know, conceptually a subsidy for 12 months, um, but the people who are receiving it would need to check in fairly regularly, and that is going to take a lot of staff to do that. Um, 
Could we? I, I think we, I'm going to let Angela talk about the moratorium and 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 how she might see it. I don't always entirely agree with um, Angela. Uh, I do think that the mediation program, which we started fairly late, um, can go a long way to solving some of those issues um, short of needing to change the moratorium. Um, and yeah. Could we? Uh, are we able to, it may be too early to tell, it may be a legal question, but are we able to add provisions to uh, the federal outline? Like for instance, if we wanted to continue the requirement of no rent increases for uh, uh, fa families or landlords that take advantage of this new tranche of money, would we be able to add something like that onto our program requirements? Yeah, from my point of view, our program that we put together for rental housing stabilization program had a number of tenant protections in it, including the don't raise the rent and cease evictions. And, um, and we also said uh, we didn't wanna spend money on places that uh, had life safety issues and uh, really were in dire need of repair. Um, and so, this statute doesn't have tenant protections like that in it. It hints at them. It says that you could be at risk of homelessness because of um, health and safety issues. So it, it, but it doesn't require those tenant protections, but I would certainly advocate for there to be tenant protections um, in this process. Um, okay. One of the things that's, the last program required, in order for the landlord to get 100% of the rent that the landlord was owed, the tenant and the landlord had to apply together or looking at it the other way around. In order for the tenant to get 100% of what they owed paid, the landlord and the tenant had to apply together. The new program is really based on the tenant household application and all the landlord has to do is cooperate with receiving the money and even if they don't cooperate, the money can be paid to the tenant household to pay the, the rent or the utility bill. So um, it, I don't know how much it's going to be about being able to make landlords promise to do certain things, but um, it seems like um, that because it's about housing, we could make the program aware of uh, repair issues and things like that. My fantasy is being able to use those other housing expenses that um, is in the, the federal statute, hasn't been defined yet by the Secretary of the Treasury to make repairs. I, I would love to see well, that money available to make repairs to keep units online. Well, suffice it to say, there are members of this committee that share that fantasy. So we're going to move on uh, to Angela because we only have a few Minutes. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, Thank you. Angela, uh, I know you weren't thrilled with all the provisions in the eviction moratorium because you wanted some guarantee of monies, but you stayed with us and I think you were justly rewarded uh, and it worked out. Uh, so give us any thoughts you might have in five minutes or so if you could. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Angela Zaykowski. I'm the director of the Vermont Landlords Association. I'm also a practicing attorney and I represent landlords around the state of Vermont, um, primarily in eviction type proceedings. Um, I think what I have not heard my other two uh, witnesses this morning uh, talk about is uh, the collaboration and cooperation um, it's at sort of an unprecedented level that we saw between tenant advocates, landlord advocates, the state, Vermont State Housing Authority. Um, Senator Sorok, and getting to your point, we have been meeting weekly um, since June. <laughs> maybe, um, yeah. about this program. So myself, uh, Jean Murray, Wendy Morgan from Legal Aid, uh, folks from the administration, uh, the folks from Vermont State Housing Authority, and that's part of the reason why we have seen some of these additions and changes to the program as it's progressed, because we were able to, by having those weekly meetings, see areas that needed to be addressed, look to whether within the authorizing legislation we could develop new avenues to the program and 
when we were given the okay, did it. Um, so the mediation program is actually one of those um, concepts that sort of came out of this weekly meeting of the stakeholders um, as a way to deal with some of the impacts and effects of the eviction moratorium. Um, and what the mediation program did was pay um, for professional mediators um, up to $3,000 of mediation costs uh, for landlord and tenant disputes. Uh, it, we didn't require that there was a pending eviction case. Um, and so it just, we just needed a landlord and tenant to say we're having an issue and we'd like somebody to come help us um, resolve those, those issues. Uh, we didn't launch the program until the middle of October. Um, so this was a very late to the game um, type of program. Uh, we did get eight applications in. Um, they all came in late in November and into December. Uh, so, it, it, you know, again, it's that lead time that we're talking about um, with wanting to have some funds allocated now so we can start developing a new program because we know with anything, there is time. It takes time to get programs up off the ground and to get the word out that these programs are available. Um, of those eight applications for mediation, uh, six actually managed to mediate uh, before the deadline at the end of December. Um, four of them completely resolved. Um, one was a partial resolution uh, and one uh, did not resolve, though that mediation happened on December 28th. And I think if we would have had more time, um, it may have and folks would have had additional resources, our HSP still being available to them. It, is possible that it could have resolved as well. Um, the average cost for mediation was $1,000. Um, so it was a relatively low uh, cost way to help or just have one more avenue for folks to have their issues addressed. Um, I feel like they're being heard. I feel like they're having some sort of process. Um, so that's actually one program that we would encourage the legislature to look at uh, continuing to fund um, because I think it will help offset some of the challenges of the eviction moratorium. Okay, thank you. Um, so that money for the mediation has come out of your $250,000? Um, correct. And uh, the uh, ACCD actually recaptured 85,000 of that 250,000 um, because we were not going to be able to use it by the end of the year. Um, if we would have had an extension by the federal government sooner, that would have been fantastic. Um, so math wise that we used 100 and whatever 250 minus 85 is. <laughs> Okay, um, I just, uh, I sort of never got the question answers and it's up for anybody in terms of the penetration rate, uh, how aware of the program, I, I mean, having it be a joint landlord tenant program, I imagine that there uh, in the landlord community, there are a lot of people that uh, tell their tenants about it and get the application going yada yada but uh, I'm just wondering if there are a bunch of tenants out there that could use this help that are unaware of the program. I mean it's entirely possible. Um, we did advertising this actually the state judiciary system um, sent out uh, information to I think pretty much every pending eviction case about the various programs to the attorneys or parties of record. Um, you know, we did outreach. I know I did seminars with CVOEO about these programs. There were Facebook ad campaigns by my organization, by other organizations. Uh, Vermont State Housing Authority did front porch forum information out to the entire state. There were radio advertisements. Um, there was a, a video that was created and then translated into seven or eight languages about the program. Um, so we've really tried hard to cover as many avenues as possible to reach everybody. Is it perfect? No. Um, short of a direct mail to every person in the state of Vermont, um, it, it's challenging, but I think we've covered as many bases as we could. Um, can I just jump in? Because I, I really think that even though we did all of that, uh, Vermont Legal Aid, we did town halls um, on YouTube and things like that. 
that it would help if we um, did essentially road shows to service organizations for um, like, like the community action programs and the uh, councils on aging and things like that. Because um, everyone, and it seemed surprising to us every once in a while, you'd hear about somebody who was saying, oh, I didn't hear about this before. And sad stories like I put all my rent on my credit card and now you're telling me I can't get money to pay off my credit card. I can only get money for rent. So that kind of, so um, I think uh, being able to really do a campaign and go to service organizations and, and things like that is something that I, I want to do better in this coming year. Um, because as I say, it was a real rush. Vermont Legal Aid got lots of phone calls. Vermont Landlords Association got lots of phone calls. Vermont State Housing Authority got lots of phone calls. I mean, we added staff to answer the phone and, and so did Angela and so did Vermont State Housing Authority. And still there were always more phone calls and people that were trying to find out information. So I think we could do better. Um, it, Senator Clark, so very, very briefly, because we need to take a break. And we got to get uh, done. Just, the just quickly, is this one of the creative ways we could continue to continue this program with some of our new stimulus dollars? Some of the two hundred million—I don't even know what we're really calling that money—but stimulus two, um, encumbered stimulus two. It, it strikes me that because it's about rental and 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 mediation, that it might fall under the creative umbrella of that. I think we're still waiting to get some guidance on that. It was part of um, a series of questions that have been posed right. or are being posed by the state um, to Treasury to find out these answers because we're trying to figure out how many of our existing programs we can cover under this new money. Um, the new guidance that came out are uh, making it harder and harder for us to think that we're going to be able to do as much. But we're, don't worry, we got a creative group. We're, we've all got our thinking hats on. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. It's been very informative and we're catching up and uh, great work under tough circumstances. So we're going to break till 1055. We'll hear from Maura for 20 minutes or 25 minutes will take 10 minutes to talk about and vote out, hopefully, uh, the deed restriction bill S14. Um, so we'll see you in eight minutes. Thank you. I'm sorry, I guess my video wasn't on. Nathan, are we ready to go? We are. Thank you. Um, okay, we're gonna move on to the home mortgage assistance program with Mora. And um, more, we've been asking people to give us an update on what's been happening since we adjourned and uh, going forward, whether you have thoughts as to what we can do to continue to address the need. The pandemic hasn't stopped. Uh, the program may have stopped. Hopefully we can get it up and going in some form. We've got a lot of housing money coming our way. It's restricted, may not allow for this. I, I, actually, I thought I may have read that there may be some mortgage assistance monies in the new uh, bill as well, or in the Biden proposal. So I'm going to give the floor over to you. We're probably going to stop at uh, in about 20 minutes, if that's okay. That is more than okay. I have a very hard stop at 1130. So thank you. My name is Maura Collins. I am the director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And I'm joined today by my colleague Chad Simmons. Um, Senator Ballant may remember Chad from his Wyndham County Brattleboro days. He's keeping it real. Wyndham County represent. Chad, oh so God. nice to see you. So nice Good to, to see, see you all. And um, he currently is a Washington County resident, but um, most importantly is now uh, VHFA's newest employee helping me out with um, covering the state house. So um, you will see him more when we are back um, in the building. I wanted you to have a face to put with the name. Um, and he's our new housing policy and engagement specialist. Um, oh, great. Welcome. It, Welcome. It won't surprise any of you, um, Senator Sorokin, to answer your question. Yes, I do have thoughts on all of those matters. I have thoughts on just about anything housing related. Why am I not surprised? Exactly. 
Um, in fact, I was hoping I could just take uh, just a moment or two um, to reiterate what and support what my you've heard from my colleagues already, just to make sure it's clear um, the endorsement VHFA has for what you've already heard. Um, VHCB did incredible work allocating an entire year's worth of appropriations in six months on top of what they normally had to appropriate. I mean, that was that was a huge effort and it's really gonna help. You know, I love my data and I can't wait to see how this is going to help the housing market and make a difference in our homeless system long-term. And it was really, to say it was too bad doesn't do it justice. It, it was really um, problematic that the federal funding that deadline that limited Vermont's ability to be even more transformational, but we should be proud of what Vermont did because Vermont and California are the only two states that I've heard of that use capital to address homelessness in the way that is going to be systemic and really create housing opportunities permanently for these households. So I know that the needs have risen since then, but it, it would be, if we only focus on those unmet needs, we are really not doing um, justice to what has been accomplished. Um, similarly, VSHA with the administration of a huge $20 million rental assistance program, uh, Jean mentioned how they stood up a program within 10 days of the law being passed. Um, again, I'm, I'm in this national network with peers of state housing agencies across the country, and most states had a much harder time moving a fraction of the money VSHA did because of the complications that those states inadvertently put up as barriers that they thought were well-intentioned, but as the months dragged on and no one was applying and there were problematic forms and certifications and documents, those best intentions to means test or look for documents really um, harmed their ability to uh, get that assistance out. And I believe that those legislators then heard from those constituents almost like a DOL unemployment claim problem that we had here in Vermont, they were getting that on the housing assistance side because there were just too many clogs in the system to help people when they need it most. So I hope that serves as a lesson for the future as we look at this $200 million that Vermont, the state, and we as trusted partners can be trusted to deliver amazing results, which I'm gonna tell you about with the mortgage assistance in just a second, that meet the legislative intent, because we talk to you all a lot and we know what you want, we know what where your priorities are, and I believe every time exceed expectations. So um, I really hope that this $200 million, that we keep the spirit around creativity and pushing the envelope and really thinking about what we can do with this and not put too many additional restrictions on what that looks like because the US Treasury, as Richard referenced, is already gonna impose way too many rules. This is going to be problematic when it comes out that there's $200 million that we can't deliver in Vermont fully because of federal rules yet again. I, I'm okay, Senator Clarkson. I don't know if Senator Surratt can see Senator, me. Senator Clarkson, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, Maura, thank you. I, I agree. We need to applaud this incredible partnership that's been so productive for Vermont and Vermont uh, Vermont's housing world. Um, is your group of national, uh, of Vermont, uh, is your national group also pushing on Treasury to, uh, to sort of open up the flexibility? Because... I know you're part of the housing partners, but you also have your own financing powerhouse group. I hope you're also pushing because you lend a different kind of credibility and a different voice. Yeah, and um, rest assured, I won't go into all the details of what's happening. Not only did I just got get on that national board that is doing that work, but um, we uh, there were a lot of state housing finance agency officials who are now in the Biden-Harris administration. They're having direct conversations with the new Treasury um, administration, and um, that those 
people are all friends. So they are listening and we are hopeful that um, some things may shake loose, but obviously we still haven't had a transition yet. We have another hour to go. So I don't want to over promise, but the advocacy efforts are robust and in line with what you've been hearing from the Vermont partners. Um, so you asked for an overview of the MAP program, the mortgage assistance program that VHFA was trusted with by the legislature. Um, we had an initial award of $5 million from you all uh, in November. It looked like maybe um, there weren't going to be enough applications to use all that. So we turned back $300,000. Josh Hanford tells me that that was used for the red tag fuel assistance program that you know has been a real need in the state. So um, I appreciate that our money has been used for a housing related um, use. Uh, I am confident that if the deadline had been extended earlier and um, if we could have kept our applications open, that there's no question that the need will continue. And I can speak to that in a minute. Of the $4.7 million that we have for the program, we have cut checks, delivered, everything is done um, for all but $72,000 of it. That $72,000 is um, just the, the scrappy tail end of the amount. And we have already gotten an extension from the state for three months to um, go back and revisit households who did not receive the full six months of assistance to check with them to see if they need more assistance to get them up to that six month amount. We've prioritized applicants with the lowest incomes in doing that so that we know we're still matching your intent to serve those who need this program the most. Um, that is in process right now and, and we only have um, three months to cut those checks. As a reminder, the money that we distributed went directly to the loan servicers, not to the homeowner, um, so that we know that for the 638 households that we were able to serve, that we have prevented foreclosure for those households because there are rules that if a servicer receives money as a payment on behalf of a homeowner, from the homeowner or um, from a program like this, that even if they were in some level of a foreclosure filing, that all gets stopped and they have to start the process over again. So not only do we have the foreclosure moratorium, obviously, that the governor keeps extending, but also this program has prevented foreclosure. And that is critical um, because 65% of the people assisted with this program had some kind of forbearance agreement but the remainder did not, the other 35% did not have a forbearance agreement. And so if they were several months in arrears, they were at risk of foreclosure once the moratoriums lift, both state and federal. And even for the 65% of homeowners that have some kind of forbearance agreement, not all forbearance agreements are uniform. They all look a little different. And so sometimes, a lender will allow a homeowner to skip making mortgage payments. And then once the payments restart, uh, then the loan amount is, the monthly payment is modified. And there's a short time window when a um, homeowner would have to pay back those missed mortgage payments. Other, and what I hope is much more common and what I expect to see, what VHFA does, what I believe most of our Vermont banks do, is instead take those missed mortgage payments and tack them on to the end of the mortgage, just extending the term. So if my mortgage were to end in 2047, maybe it'll now end in 2048. Frankly, as long as my monthly payment doesn't change, that does solve my problem right now. And I'm, I'm sorry I have an extra year's payments, but that um, was an okay program and that would be successful. But we don't always know which kind of forbearance agreement um, a homeowner has. And so just having forbearance is not necessarily um, a, an easy pass that this loan won't end up in foreclosure. So Additionally, Laura, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, if I can interrupt, um, I remember last year you were obviously advocating for more money uh, for this program. Uh, it sounds like uh, the amount was close to being sufficient that we put in, but I'm, I'm questioning if the banks knew about 
this money, it seems like they would, which I'm sure they all did, that it would be uh, in their interest to, and there was a back mortgage payment, it would be their interest to get an application in for that home. So does that mean that there were only like 600 odd homeowners in the entire state of Vermont that were in arrear on their mortgages? I find that very hard to believe and I'll show you the data that proves why I don't think that's the case. Um, I think we need, I, I love behavioral economics and I think we need to be realistic about if you're told that you don't need to make a payment for six months and potentially that could be renewed for up to 12 months, then a lot of people will not apply for assistance because they're thinking, well, I don't need to make a payment. Some folks, I don't think, understand that they may, that they definitely will have to make those payments at some point and that those payments could translate into a higher monthly payment once they turn back on. Um, so I, I think that there, it's another reason why homeownership education counseling and financial education is so critical is to have, to help folks really understand the implications of this. I was very surprised. You do remember I was saying there were 45,000 Vermont mortgaged households that would be eligible under the income limits that we set. And so if even 10% of them applied, I would have expected applications closer to 4,000, 5,000 um, and not the 650 that we got. Um, so I do, I do think that the for the foreclosure moratorium and the forbearances that are available were two tools that also have kept the um, demand for this program lower than what we would have seen. If people um, are not, don't have the fear of foreclosure uh, on them, it's possible that they didn't apply for this kind of assistance, thinking that they don't have to worry about foreclosure. But given the acute awareness and sophistication of the banks, uh, wouldn't they tell the more the mortgage uh, that um, hey, here's some money that can help with your disposable income going forward. Why don't you apply for this? Uh, um, at a loss, did the, did the banks not want to get involved in this unless they absolutely had to? No, I wouldn't characterize that. I actually, I know with especially our participating lenders and many banks were, um, I, I can't tell you how often I would go to a bank's website and see mention of our program on their website. Um, so I think that there were many Vermont banks and credit unions that um, did promote this. Um, it was amazingly shocking to us since, since we're used to working with the same servicers for VHFA loans, this was a stretch for us because we had to work with all these servicers that we'd never worked with before. And there are a lot of um, Vermonters who have mortgages with national servicers that we had never heard of. We were Googling to make sure they were legit because they sounded absolutely fraudulent. They turned out not to be, but um, it was, uh, um, incredible the um, the range of situations that um, Vermonters have with their mortgages, and so I I can't say that all the these companies um, did that kind of outreach, especially these big national banks that you see most of. I mean, there are a ton. The number one mortgage lender in Vermont is Quicken through Rocket Mortgage. I mean, that they're not the local partner, I can call up the bank president and say, hey, can you get your staff to do some marketing to help us out? Um, so th there are some limitations to that kind of outreach that you're speaking to. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that there was not a lender that we reached out to directly that we asked them to do something. Every single one of them did something, put a, put a note in a mailing or put something on their website or the like. I also think that we, we need to really think about um, the income targeting of this program. Uh, we paid about $1,100 a month um, for the mortgage assistance we paid. And most of these homeowners needed more than six months of assistance. So we were paying about six grand per homeowner. 
Um, but the median income of who we served was only $3,000 a month. That's $36,000 a year. So this was very much a very low income targeted program. So when you look at the universe, it would be very fair for higher income households to turn to you, me, the feds, anyone else and say, what about a program for us? Because there are many people who are earning more than um, $36,000. Did, but, your, did your mortgage, were your mortgages covered under this program? They were eligible, but we made an ultra conservative decision to not reach out to our borrowers um, and do the kind of marketing that you're talking about because we were hesitant that it could seem that VHFA was preferencing our own mortgages. So our mortgage holders had, you know, were absolutely eligible and some were served. But for instance, we have a few right now that, we're feeling for because they are more than six months in arrears and we'd like to help them with this $72,000, but it, we, we have not reopened the program because we can, it's only, we only have a three month extension. And so it would not be fair for us to serve our mortgage holders above another lender's mortgage holders who could be in that same position and did not apply during the open window. Senator Clarkson. So Maura, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to understand the income, the annual income scale of the families you help. Are you telling me that a significant percent of your families had more had incomes of only thirty six thousand a year and owned homes yes, on that amount? But we only were looking at the previous ninety days of income prior to ah, them applying. Okay. You had asked us to not look at annual. Income, you know, you kind of right. didn't care if they used to make eighty thousand dollars. If they were making zero today, you want them to be eligible. So right, got it, got it. Right, I, I remember. That is a ninety-day number that we've annualized, um, which is why I right. always think about it in terms of monthlies. Um, but eighty-four percent of the households we served with this program were more than six months in arrears. So what this really shines a light on is that perennial perpetual problem of housing unaffordability. It shows um, that by the time we were cutting checks to folks that they were already several months behind and very much at risk of foreclosure. So going forward, we only have about uh, five or 10 more minutes, but uh, going forward, is there anything on the horizon for mortgage assistance? Uh, there is a federal bill um, sponsored by Rhode Island Senator Jack Reed, who um, my national association is strongly supporting um, this bill and has, uh, I will be reintroduced um, in this Congress, and that would provide mortgage assistance. There was a lot of talk that um, the previous stimulus money that has passed was, there was a, a lengthy debate about if that would include mortgages as well as rental assistance. Um, and uh, so it was very disappointing to see that mortgage assistance was not included. And again, a lot of advocacy around trying to either redefine what has passed already that we've been talking about the 200 million or quickly pass um, the, the next program I referenced, which would include mortgage assistance. And how about, I mean, the, how about the Biden uh, I think that's what she's referring to. No, no, I'm speaking no? of something different. The Biden proposal um, that I've read speaks to homelessness assistance and some other programs. It still continues to push mostly for rental assistance. And I have not seen mortgage assistance be called out. So again, we're in the National Association is in direct conversation um, with Treasury to push hard for there to be more flexibility. We are not the only state who is frustrated by this. Um, in fact, uh, we may be more aggrieved by this decision because we have a higher home ownership rate than many other states. Um, right. And so it's extra hard for rural states like Vermont. Um, and so, but at the same time, home ownership rates also track with race. And so urban centers, as well as states that have higher BIPOC populations, um, do you see tremendous need for rental assistance? Okay. So Maura, we have two minutes. If you would, I hate to cut you off, you know that, but if you have anything else you'd like to share with us, uh, 
let's go for that. We could clearly have you back soon. Yeah. Uh, and I hope you're part of this working group that uh, can make creative out of the box recommendations on how to not give some of this new money back to other states. So I also, too, the last point I just wanted to make about the success of this program that we're extra proud of is that every week you've probably seen in my previous reports to the state that we had a website where we were publicly tracking all the applications for our programs. So the media policymakers, the state, anyone could go and look week to week how much money we had paid out, who was applying, where they were from, what their demographics were. And now that we've closed the program, we're very pleased to see we could make adjustments as time went on and we could see, oh, we're underserving Rutland a little bit. Let's beef up our marketing and that kind of transparency um, we were proud of. And in the end, our applicants were younger, more racially diverse, with larger households, lower incomes and more likely to be disabled than the general population. And so um, we really see what we've been able to do here as um, a win for those underserved Vermonters. And uh, VHFA was proud to be able to play this role in this pandemic. And it's again, awkward to put it this way. And if I could say it better, I would, And but it's not coming to me, but we, we hope we can play a similar role going forward, not because the need, um, we're, we're hopeful for continued need, but the economic impact of this recession um, will continue. And as uh, foreclosure moratoriums lift nationally as, um, and at some point the state level as um, forbearance agreements run out. We had a lot of people in Vermont and nationally who applied for forbearance when they didn't necessarily need it. And they were able to make payments last summer, um, and, but their income had gone down and they went for forbearance. They didn't necessarily need it. Those, um, that clock is running out. Now, if they do need it more, they may not be eligible for that kind of assistance again. And um, so they started a clock, but didn't take advantage of it. They kept making monthly mortgage payments. Um, there are concerns that we see in the forecast, um, which is why we will be uh, pushing hard for the federal government to not only support new mortgage assistance through the feds, but also um, look for the kind of sustainable long-term capital solutions that VHCB was talking about, where there has long been a push to increase the amount of federal tax credits, HUD appropriations that go to support the creation of affordable rental housing. Those are the things that are going to transform our housing market for the long term as we emerge from this. Great. Thank you so much, Maura. Right. Terrific. Okay, folks, uh, we're going to move on to Ellen and uh, S14. Um, Ellen, would you like to join us? Hi, Ellen. Um, so, um, we took a straw vote on this. <coughs> I've tried, I feel somewhat unsuccessful to explain this bill several times. All I can say is that I will do my best to do you proud on Friday. And my goal is to keep it under two minutes long in terms of my explanation. Uh, unless people have questions, <coughs> I'm not going to try and explain it again. Uh, Ellen, is there any change from what we straw voted on that you're aware of at this time? And what is the draft number at this point? Um, S14 is still as it was introduced. So no changes okay. have been made. So in an effort to move this forward very quickly, unless people have questions or comments, I am going to move that our committee vote out favorably S14 as introduced. I would second that. Okay, uh, can I, I don't, I see Senator Brock is not visual. Senator Rahm may not be with us. Uh, Senator Rahm has had to go off to do those right. international things she was asked to do. So can I just see a show of hands? All those in favor of S14, raise their hand. Okay, 401. And I will report the bill and this afternoon I'll turn it in to the Senate Secretary's office and it will be up for second reading on Friday and Senator Ballin, I hope 
you will be in a position to move to suspend the rules after that is again it's a retroactive bill yep. and i have been in touch with uh, the house on this um senator bray has inquired whether he should look at it i told him he does so at his peril but i'm happy to go in there and explain it to him so um that's where we are and i think we're done by oh we're early so we'll i won't be on the floor this afternoon but we'll see you all tomorrow morning thank right you thank, thank you this was great